Hello and welcome to the Maltz Museum's annual Hear Our Voices MLK Day celebration. My name is Dahlia Fisher, Director of External Relations. And behalf of everyone at the Maltz Museum, thank you for choosing to join us online today. As of today, we officially reopen to the public. Admission is through time ticketing, masks are required, and social distancing guidelines are enforced. That means you can safely visit us in person Sundays and Mondays now through February 24th when we launch the highly anticipated special exhibition, Notorious RBG, The Life and Times of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, presented locally by PNC Bank. Join us in person Wednesdays through Sundays or from home. You can sign up for a virtual exhibit tour and enjoy online programs with incredible speakers like the ones you'll hear from today. And thank you to our sponsor, the Jewish Federation of Cleveland's Community Relations Committee, for making today's events possible, with additional support for online programs from Cleveland Jewish News. Together with our many community partners and programming partners, we are learning from the past to better understand the present so that we can build a more just, civil, and inclusive future. Learn more about our work at www maltzmuseum.org. Good afternoon. My name is Kevin Adelstein. I'm a publisher and CEO of the Cleveland Jewish News and president of the Cleveland Jewish Publication Company. And on behalf of the Malt Museum of Jewish Heritage and with support from the Jewish Federation of Cleveland's Community Relations Committee, as well as the many community partners representing organizations across our city, state, and country, it is an honor to introduce an important program on such an important day today. This MLK Day, we celebrate the legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. by exploring one of America's most fascinating museums housed inside Ferris State University in Big Rapids, Michigan. The Jim Crow Museum of Racist Memorabilia uses racist objects of intolerance to teach tolerance and promote social justice, examining the historical patterns of race relations and the origins and consequences of race, racist depictions. The aim is to engage, to engage visitors in open and honest dialogues about this country's racial history. The founder and curator, Dr. David Pilgrim has said, I quote, we are not afraid to talk about race and racism. We are afraid not to. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we are fortunate to have Dr. Pilgrim with us to do just that. An applied sociologist with doctorate from the Ohio State University, Dr. Pilgrim is both the founder and director of the Jim Crow Museum, and he is vice president for diversity and inclusion at Ferris State University. A prolific writer, Dr. Pilgrim is author of Understanding Jim Crow, using racist memorabilia to teach tolerance and promote social justice, as well as countless additional writings used by scholars, students, and civil rights and human rights workers to better understand historical and contemporary expressions of racism. Dr. Pilgrim has been interviewed by National Public Radio, Time Magazine, the British Broadcasting Corporation, and dozens of newspapers, including the New York Times, Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, Boston Globe, and the Los Angeles Times. Today, Dr. Pilgrim joins us in a discussion about race, racism, and the Jim Crow Museum. And we'll follow that by a question and answer session. You can type your questions into the chat box at any time during the discussion. At the end of the talk, I'll return on screen and we'll ask Dr. Pilgrim your questions. And now, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, once again, thank you for joining us today, and let's get started. Please join me in welcoming our guest to the screen, Dr. David Pilgrim. Thank you. Uh, if we can put the first slide up, that would be great. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I do not take for granted opportunities to talk about my work. Um, 
it's an honor. And quite frankly, it's a responsibility that I take seriously. So this first slide has a quote from Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, from the famed letter from Birmingham jail. And, you know, I travel around and I tell people that that letter is the most important public letter ever written. And then I realized about two years ago, it's the only public letter I've ever read. Nevertheless, I think the words are profound, it's often quoted, and it's certainly relevant to the work that we do in the museum. He uses a metaphor in it of a boil, of a nasty boil. And the way that you deal with a boil is to lance it and let the ugliness come out. Well, that's what we do in the Jim Crow Museum. Next slide. Uh, just a little bit of a warning. Uh, some of the images that uh, are in this PowerPoint are disturbing. I, I did not bring the most disturbing images that we have in our collection. And the ones that I did bring are only there because I need them to illustrate the point that I'm making. Uh, next slide. Uh, it occurred to me about a year or two ago that the museum is really a testimony to the resiliency of African-Americans. Um, I was actually in the museum one day and standing near a recreated lynching tree. And it just hit me as I looked at the brutal images, the thousands of everyday objects that defame, mock, and belittle African-Americans and that tree. And I thought to myself of all the wonderful things that African-Americans have achieved in this culture, in this country, despite the objects that are in the museum and what they represent. And so I wanna say early on in every presentation that I give that the museum is testimony to the resiliency of African-Americans. Next. So uh, I get this question often, when did you start collecting? Uh, I was born in Harlem, um, had some family drama. So when I was one, ended up going to Mobile, Alabama and uh, spent my formative years in Mobile. When I was 10, 11 or 12, I uh, went to a flea market uh, slash carnival. It was like this hybrid thing and everybody's selling everything and there's rides. And one of the dealers had what we would today call black memorabilia, or black Americana, or what I would refer to as racist objects on a table. I believe I purchased one of them. Whether I purchased it or not, I picked it up, threw it to the ground and broke it. It was the last piece that I broke intentionally. Next slide. I don't know who that handsome devil is. Um, in the 1990s, I donated my objects to Fair State University. Um, I had over 3,000 objects. That, that little room right there, we don't even have shelves in there. I didn't have shelves. They were just the objects that I had spent more than three decades collecting. Again, they were everyday objects. I donated them to the university with the understanding that one day the university would um, build a museum of sorts to help preserve uh, the objects. Next slide. Uh, you do not have to be an educator to recognize that there's learning going on in this room. Um, that's probably the early 1990s. Um, there are probably three or 4,000 pieces in there. Those were my students. Um, you know, Fair State University has the reputation of being a school that uses eyes on, hands on approaches to teaching. And you can see that that's precisely what's going on uh, in that room. Next slide. So I had two big fears. Uh, the first fear I had, and any of you that are 
um, obsessive collectors, you will appreciate this. My biggest fear was that I would die before the museum was built. And for a long time, it did not look like the museum was going to be built. And by that, I mean a, a museum proper. I mean, we were in a 500 foot square room, which was basically just visual storage. And even though I was doing good work, as I just demonstrated with those students, uh, it really wasn't a museum. And I kept thinking, wow, I just need to get this done. Uh, next slide. In 2012, <laughs> I was driving in 131 in Michigan and we had black ice. Uh, it was a day where the sun was shining and um, you know everything looked fine. I was driving too fast. Um, probably shouldn't say that since we're undoubtedly being recorded, but uh, driving a little bit over the speed limit. Um, and I looked and I saw that there were five or six vehicles that were off the road and a couple of them were upside down. And I remember thinking to myself, people in Michigan really don't know how to drive. And as soon as I said that, I hit whatever ice that, that had derailed them. And uh, my car did a beeline for that tree. And, um, you know, was totaled, I uh, was unconscious, but I did not die. And the museum opened shortly thereafter. Next slide. My other fear was that African Americans, especially my elders, that they wouldn't get the museum, that they would see it as a, as a shrine to racism, uh, that they would be offended by, it, that it would remind them of of a time that they wanted to forget, that it would reopen old wounds, that they wouldn't see it as a teaching tool, as an attempt to document the past so that we could learn from it. But that did not happen. And we have civil rights and human rights groups and African-American churches and uh, police officers and corporate leaders and others who come to the museum and they understand what um, what we're doing and it works. Next slide. Another question I get is why have a Jim Crow museum? I think in this country, we're used to having African American studies museums or women's studies museums or Native American studies museums, but not a museum that focuses on race, uh, race relations and racism. Um, you know, we created this museum so that we could document the past and, 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 and learn from it. Next slide. So I believe you can, I believe you can have a space that is uncomfortable but safe, where people can do the thing that many Americans don't want to do, and that is to talk about this difficult topic. And so we use these objects to try to model intelligent conversations about race, race relations, and racism. And we use those everyday objects, these relics of the past, these instances of racist propaganda to help facilitate those discussions. Next. So this is one of the one of the lessons I'd like people to take away from here. And that is, if you crush people in conversations about race, you can't teach them after that. And not only can you not teach them, you can't teach anyone who witnessed it. That doesn't mean we don't push back. It doesn't mean that when people say things that are factually incorrect, that we don't correct them. Doesn't mean we don't have engaged, passionate, sometimes even painful discussions, but that's different from crushing people. You know, over the years, well, actually when we first started, we used to use a lot of faculty docents. And this was a hard lesson for them because they were used to being right and used to people needing to know they're right, students needing to know that the fact is right. 
Um, and so a student would say something not well thought out, something again that may have been just factually wrong and the teacher would uh, embarrass them and crush them. Um, it took us a long time to make sure that our docents know the difference between engaged conversations and crushing people. Next. So one of the approaches we use is, uh, is elementary. And by that, I mean, it's often used with elementary school students. Um, it is to simply show an object and ask people, what is it you see? And so you look at an object like this, once again, it's an everyday object. This is a license plate that would have been on uh, the back of someone's car. And it's a wonderful teaching tool because it documents, once again, a point in time. In the 1960s, it was common to hear talk about the new Negro and the new Democrat. Well, this license plate, which doubles again as propaganda, this license plate is basically saying that the new Negro and the new Democrat are really just rats. And so the one on the left is supposed to be representing Martin Luther King and the one on the right representing Lyndon Baines Johnson. Next slide. Again, we bring in people and we ask, so what is it you see when you see this? Um, objects like this aren't as useful to us because most people these days, except some ideological groups, most people look at this and they recognize this for what it is, a sign of hate. Uh, we actually do better when we have like a mammy cookie jar or, or an object where, um, go to the next slide, please. Well, this one's not gonna, <laughs> this one sort of makes that same, the, the, the other point, which is, um, you know, most people I think would, would condemn this. This is a postcard. You know, uh, we get a lot of young visitors into the museum. And, you know, first of all, I have to explain to them what's a postcard you know, which is, which is interesting. And then uh, tell them like the journey of a postcard, you know, it's made, it's bought, uh, you know, it's sold, it's bought, it's distributed, goes through the, uh, the postal service uh, in the country. Um, and so on the other side of this, where it's taught saying, you know, hello, Sally, I'm down in Florida, you know, having a good time. But on this side of the postcard, you know, it, um, you know, buys into, propagates this, this narrative that Black people are not really people, that they're not at the top of the food chain, that they're actually food for animals. And again, it's a postcard, an everyday object. Next slide. Uh, I wish I could tell you um, more about this image. Uh, um, I have searched for years to try to find out, you know, the, the origins of this, of this image, and I can't. Um, but it's such a powerful image, uh, and it's a real image. I, I think most of us are aware of George Santayana's quote, but I'd like to put it up there. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Next slide. So we study the past because it happened and because we live in the residue. I'm not a historian, I'm a sociologist. I think a lot of people think I'm a historian because I, I live in the past, if you would. Um, I understand that the past is what happened. History is what uh, writers say is important about what happened in the past. And a lot of what we do in the Jim Crow Museum is to correct the historical narratives about the past. But let's, let's be upfront about this. Number one, we studied the past because it happened. You know, every now and again, someone will say to me, um, you know, why do you study the negative parts of the past? And I don't wanna be flippant, but like why study any of the past, you know? 
if you're not going to study all of it, why not, you know, why would you just study the parts that make you feel good? And then, of course, as I say here, the other reason we study the past is because we live in the residue. Next slide. And this is some of the residue. Um, I think you would, might be surprised if you come to a museum called the Jim Crow Museum to discover that we have objects from the present. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that um, the caricatures and the stereotypes that accompany those caricatures about African people, they both shape and reflect it attitudes about Black people, and they didn't stop in, in the mid-1960s. And so someone comes to the Jim Crow Museum and they're like, I thought the Jim Crow period was from the 1870s to the 1960s. Why do you have that shirt? Well, we have that shirt because some of the ideas from the past have morphed into the present. Next slide. You know, Dr. King, I have, I have nothing but love for Dr. King. And I think for much of my life, I didn't read his writings critically. Um, I read them in a celebratory type way, right? As just gospel. And I think it's the case that for most of his writings and the ideas behind his writings, I still am something of a fan who just reads them and thinks, oh, okay, that's the way things are. But there is a, there's an idea that he had, which um, I don't know if it's true or not. And that is that, that justice will eventually come, that there is this inevitability that right will win out, that the, arc of justice, right? That we're always moving in that direction. I believed that, I'm an activist. And I believe that, and that guided me and that inspired me for many, many years. And I have to tell you that even though, uh, well, let's put it this way. The last several years in this country have reinforced in my head this idea that, you know, it's not a straight line that we often have to fight to maintain and retain the victories that were fought for before us. Next slide. Next slide. So I gave a presentation once and I included this slide. It was at uh, University of Michigan uh, as a proud graduate of the Ohio State. I won't say anything bad about the University of Michigan right now. But at the end of the presentation, someone said to me, why, why do you say it's a national scene? And what, where they were going with that is that most people think of Jim Crow and segregation as something that occurred in Biloxi, Mississippi or Pensacola, Florida are my hometown of Mobile, Alabama, and that the rest of the country was immune. But first of all, segregation, like enslavement, were national scenes. However, and wherever they were expressed, they were part of this culture. And the more research I do about patterns of discrimination and mistreatment of people that were disfavored because of their skin color, the more instances I find in the North. Next slide. So in the museum, we don't have a lot of Klan material. Uh, the museum owns uh, 14 or 15 Klan uh, uniforms. We own lots of everyday Klan objects like um, Klan knives or matchboxes. And actually, if you look at the top of the screen, you'll see a purple, purple figure and a white figure up there at the top. And those are really good examples of what I mean when I say um, everyday objects, because those are um, tree toppers for a Christmas tree. 
And when I ask people when they come in and they don't know, and I'll say to them, so what is it you see? Uh, each of the objects has a function, right? So it's either, it's an ashtray, it's a postcard, it's a tree topper, but it's also something else. It's a way of, of, of talking about race in the US. Next slide. So this is a quote from my brain. It's not especially profound, but it summarizes um, you know, the way that the, the, the struggle that I believe that we often have with, with history in this country. We like happy history, narratives that make us look smart, brave, and exceptional. We want a history that has been cherry picked, one that ignores our mistreatment of the weak and disfavored, a history that can be celebrated at picnics, parades, and in smug conversations. This approach to history is neither honest nor mature. Next slide. So this is a point I was trying to make earlier. I mean, the, we're standing here under a, a lynching tree that we recreated in the museum. The uh, Equal Justice Initiative, um, you know, I think that they have now determined that there were over 4,000 African-Americans lynched uh, in the United States. Um, the goal of studying the past is to document what happened, not to make us feel good or bad. It is to understand like a mature nation, what happened. Next slide. So uh, I think it was last year, we received um, some photographs that were taken by Bruce Davison. Bruce Davison's photographs are iconic. Uh, they are real-time photographs taken during the, the civil rights um, movement or struggle in the 1960s, and we got the originals. And I, I put this here because of a couple of things. One, we sometimes get, um, you know, questions like, who can tell this story? Um, and implicit in that is the idea that only people who um, that only people who've been victimized can tell the story. And I reject that. Um, we also get this, um, the other reason I put this up here is because I sometimes hear people saying, well, you know, why do we have black history and red history and women's history and black history? And my response to that, and I hope it doesn't sound too flippant is, if you don't want those histories, then, then, then do it right. Then tell history, not um, a, as, as a narrative to make us look good, but just understand and document what happened. Well, that's what Davison did with his camera. Um, and so we're really proud. Now we're not a civil rights museum. Uh, when we move into a new facility, we will have a large civil rights section because you can't or shouldn't Tell, even in a racist museum, just tell that side of the story. You need to also tell the story of how African-Americans pushed back. Next slide. So I don't know how many of you um, read flash fiction, um, but for those of you that don't, uh, what it is, uh, flash fiction with, are, are these uh, very short, short stories. Sometimes, you know, only a paragraph. Uh, and I used to write flash fiction. And the first time I read this newspaper item, I thought to myself, this reads like some really awful flash fiction story. Um, and I, I'll let you read it for yourself. And so I'm going to pause for a minute so that you can read this. So I want to remind you of something here, which is this just appeared in a newspaper. 
it appeared without commentary, without condemnation. Um, that's a snapshot in that place at that time of a, an expression of race, race relations. Next slide. So Jim Crow, you know, you could argue Jim Crow died in, in, with the um, 1964 Civil Rights Act when, when the legislation was signed into law. You could argue it was, um, you know, ended with the Voting Rights Act shortly thereafter or with housing acts or, you know, the, the, but the fact of the matter is, is that even though we are a more democratic, more egalitarian society today than we were during the Jim Crow period, we must still remain vigilant because some of the ideas uh, in the Jim Crow Museum or ideas or some of the ideas that we, we show in the Jim Crow Museum on new and contemporary pieces are actually ideas from the past. Uh, Henry Louis Gates, this is the, um, the name dropping part of the program. Henry Louis Gates, the famous uh, Harvard professor and a friend of the museum and a mentor to me, uh, he likes to travel the country and when he travels the country, he likes to talk about the museum. And uh, he always says we have a wing in the museum on President Obama. But it's if by wing, what he means is, is we have a large showcase, then yeah. Uh, but we have objects in that showcase which show President Obama as a witch doctor, as a, a so called Uncle Tom, as a brute, as a savage. Uh, in other words, the same kinds of caricatured images uh, are representations of African Americans that you would have found in the 1930s, 1940s, and 1950s um, were, were also ways that, that he was represented. Uh, that rope, by the way, that's a, that was part of a t-shirt. Again, an everyday object. Next slide. Yeah, we have a really big section on blackface. And um, you know, I could tell you some interesting stories about, I'll tell you a couple. One is, is I think most of us know that uh, blackface minstrelsy was probably the first great American form of entertainment in the 1830s. Um, I think most of us, or some of us are aware of the so-called coon songs which occurred in the 1880s. Um, we probably understand that even after uh, 1900, when, when um, professional blackface minstrelsy started to fade in popularity, that you still had um, you know, cities and towns uh, where their high schools or their rotary clubs or their churches or their colleges where they would, where people would would have amateur uh, blackface performances, and that this lasted in this country until the 1950s and 1960s, uh, and that today we still have in safe white spaces, um, you know, people who um, dress in some form of blackface and mock uh, African Americans. Next. Oh, you know, I forgot. Could you go back to that picture for a minute, please? Uh, this is why I don't control the thing because I wouldn't be able to do that. Um, I don't know how many people know that, um, that we had white Americans who blackened their face with uh, grease paint, with shoe polish, which I don't even know how that would be realistic, but shoe polish uh, with burnt cork uh, and who were on stage um, misrepresenting African Americans. But do we know that we also had people do that and rob banks and rape people and murder? So in one of one of the books that I wrote, Watermelon Nooses and Straight Razors, uh, I give a um, sort of a, a, a sampling of people that white Americans who were arrested, dressed in blackface, who had committed horrible crimes. And I just found out, this is something, I just found this out yesterday. I was doing, or uh, last night, I was doing some research on the Sibonese, Sibonese Liberation Army, you know, the ones who kidnapped uh, Patty Hearst. For those of us that are a little older, we remember that. But that uh, when they went to kidnap her, 
I think this was in 1970, someone correct me if I'm wrong. Um, one of the white kidnappers was actually dressed in blackface. Next slide. So we have a couple of traveling exhibits. Uh, this one's called Hateful Things. Uh, these are objects from the, the museum. Uh, we have another traveling exhibit called Them, Images of Separation. And those have some anti-Black pieces, but they also have uh, pieces that mock and defame poor whites, women, uh, people from Asian countries, um, uh, people new, new to this country, uh, uh, members of the LGBTQ committee. Uh, committee. Uh, so those are our two current traveling exhibits. We're actually going to uh, 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 create a traveling exhibit uh, with the uh, Davison collection uh, of those original uh, photographs. Um, and uh, in about two years, I hope that we are complete, uh, or have completed building a 4,000 foot traveling exhibit, uh, which basically replicates uh, the Jim Crow Museum. So that, that's a massive undertaking. Next slide. Yeah. You know, again, uh, you know, the first time I read Letter from Birmingham Jail, I was probably 15 or 16. And it's like I didn't even read it. I mean, when I read it now, it's like, oh my goodness. I didn't know this was in there. I didn't know this was in there. I mean, obviously I'm older now and spent time thinking on these things, but you often hear this quote, even young people, young, old, whatever, people will, will read this quote. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. You hear, I mean, it's on t-shirts, postcards, whatever. And so when you ask yourself, what does that really mean? You know, what does that mean to me? So for most of my career as this garbage collector, um, I would see objects that defamed other groups and mocked other groups, but I didn't collect it because I was, I was trying to build a Jim Crow music. Um, and I would sometimes get criticized when I would travel to, to give a talk. Someone would say, uh, you say that you oppose um, discrimination, you, you oppose racism, but you only um, collect objects, you only deal with objects that defame uh, African-Americans. And again, my answer, which now feels a little flippant was, yeah, because I'm building a Jim Crow museum. I'm not building a museum about all the others. But at some point I thought to myself, you know what? You know, I need to also tell or help tell those stories. Next slide. So um, there is no doubt in my mind after a lifetime of collecting this material that Africans and their American descendants have been caricatured more often and in more ways than up every minority group. I think a very close second would be women because you have these caricatures among others, the hag, the nag, the shrew, the gold digger. Um, and I'm just trying to think, I'm, I'm uh, trying not to use some other, uh, other language, but, but for the most part, I think I can, I can argue that African-Americans are, you know, especially, uh, um, uh, well, I wanna just limit it to African-Americans. I would say Africans and their American descendants have been caricatured more often. In this particular case, this is a costume from uh, Walmart. And I don't mind telling you it's from Walmart because Walmart is written on it. And if you notice <clears throat> the price of it, and why is that significant? If we were together in a room, I would point to someone in the audience, make them give me an answer. But the reason it's significant is because it's $16.82. And um, that's cheap enough that this object is accessible or has great accessibility to people. So it's an object that most Americans could walk into or could have walked into Walmart and purchased. And think to yourself, when people put on a costume that defames an ethnic group, how do they act once they put it on? Uh, they act out their, their racial stereotypes in terms of their gait, the, the way they walk, 
uh, the way they talk, the way they interact with others. And so it becomes a way, a, a way of performing our racism. Next. Um, we have a very large collection of objects that misrepresent the indigenous people of this country. I think we have over 2000 objects so far. And um, uh, again, it's not, it's not uh, you know, something you would expect to see in a Jim Crow museum, but it's an important, um, um, it helps us to tell some important lessons. It's uh, one of the things I've noticed about uh, some of the ways that we treat minority groups. Uh, I'll give you the example of dealing with so-called Indians. We either idolize and romanticize them. So the strong uh, brave, the, the beautiful, uh, virginal, um, you know, sort of Pocahontas. You know, so you have that side. And then on the other side, you have this, this idea of, of a savage, of a brute, of a hypersexual sort of Jezebel uh, female. And this, you, you, you know, this, this distinction, this, this, this artificial distinction is represented in literally thousands, if not millions of, once again, everyday objects in our culture. And I don't want you to lose sight of this. Objects reflect attitudes, tastes, and values, but they also shape them. Next slide. Um, this is actually a video game. And uh, I don't get to teach much anymore because of my work in administration, but uh, when I was in the classroom, actually one of my class, I was a sociology professor. I came to class one day. And students were playing this game in class where you shot uh, people as they crossed the border and you got so many points based on, on what you, uh, you know, uh, on how many people you shot or killed. And I was uh, disappointed to discover that versions and variations of this game are still on, 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 the, on the internet. Next slide. So um, I think you could make the argument that uh, poor white people, especially um, what you might call exceptionally poor, you know, like the American underclass, are often uh, stereotyped and caricatured in ways similar to the ways that uh, racial minorities are. Um, and uh, poor whites are one of the few groups in the US where the word trash is associated with them. So um, poor white trash, white trash, trailer park trash, those kinds of terms. Next slide. Uh, this right here, uh, the one on the left, I think is a postcard. The one on the right is a trade card. And um, this idea of othering, um, Jewish people in our country has a long history. Uh, a lot of it is in two-dimensional image, images, but um, um, one of my colleagues, uh, which I can talk about her work later, she collects, again, similar objects to me, uh, so-called Keith, you know, the little whatnots and souvenirs and the like. Uh, again, this idea that they are uh, different from us, uh, strange to us, a danger to us. Next slide. So one of the worst times of the year for uh, those of us that do racial justice work is Halloween. Um, be, and if you, if you go to party, I think it's called Party USA or Halloween USA, those stores that prop up um, like September and October uh, to sell Halloween costumes. Uh, you'll notice <clears throat> uh, racial uh, caricature and stereotyping in those uh, in costumes. And uh, again, I say to you, when people wear a costume, they don't just wear the costume. They perform or act out their racial prejudices. I, I really like, to the right-hand side of that, I really like the, um, that campaign uh, that was done at... Um, Ohio University, where they took a number of the costumes and they pushed back. 
and said, this is not who we are and this is not us. Next slide. Uh, I don't know how many of you have gone to the National Conference of Race and Ethnicity. I've been going for like a thousand years. Um, and uh, the 1990s, I went down and it was in New Orleans. And it was not this, it was not this image, but it was one similar to this. Uh, and it was on a t-shirt. And, um, you know, and I, I should have bought it. Uh, but in those days, I, I, again, I was focused on building a Jim Crow music. And so this, this piece, which, uh, and it's a great teaching tool because when you, when you look at it and you ask the question, people know what they see. And so you ask it, so what is it you see? All right. Well, what you see is is someone who is pushing back against a woman who they believe has violated the appropriate script, who is a strong woman. I forget the politics for a minute. Is a strong woman who, in their minds, violates the script of how women are supposed to act. Therefore, she must be a man. And it's it's. It's so similar to me in some ways um, when, I, when I look at newspaper accounts of, of um, people of white Americans being angry at ambitious black people in the 1960s and 1970s and 1980s and accusing them of being white or acting white because they violated the racial script in that case. Next slide. Um, so in addition to the Jim Crow Museum, I, I collected about three or 4,000 pieces. Again, everyday objects, toys, games, postcards, anything you could name that you would find in someone's home so that we could use to also understand caricatures of women and the stereotypes that uh, accompany them. And uh, that collection is now in that little room, that 500 foot square room um, that where we used to have the, um, you know, the Jim Crow coach. Next slide. Again, this is from my brain. Again, I'm not suggesting that it's profound, um, but I believe this. If it requires courage to speak in a situation, there is something wrong with that situation. And there, is, there are no exceptions. There are no exceptions. I'm a sociologist and we tend to be relativistic in everything, but I'm gonna go all absolutist here. There is no exception. Any situation where it requires courage to speak, there is something wrong with that situation. That does not mean that it sometimes does not require courage to speak. It often does, but I'm saying there's something wrong with that situation. By the way, that's a trade card. Um, it was produced during the period when women were fighting for the right to vote. And um, of course, this is saying um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a vulgar and coarse way, you should not have a voice. Next slide. So here's some odds and ends. Um, again, as I say, uh, things that I couldn't find a good segue for but that I wanted to make sure that I said. Next. Wherever we are, it could be a university, um, a museum, a church, the first work begins with us. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. We can talk about changing our programs, and changing uh, trainings and, and professional development and all this other stuff. Um, but the first work begins with us. And I am so convinced of this. Any meaningful work about diversity, inclusion, equity starts in our thinking. Any meaningful work. That's where the work is done. It's done in our heads. Um, next slide. So this is a book actually that uh, a colleague and I just finished at Ferris. It's, it's not a shameful plug. It's actually me trying to make a different point. Uh, I taught at Ferris for 17 years, and I was in my current position as VP uh, for about, 
I don't know, five, six, seven, eight, nine years. And I did not know this story. Um, I was walking around campus one day and noticed that the art on our campus was profoundly white. And this guy who works in our office, he's a, a graphic designer. Um, I said to him, I want you to do me a favor, find a picture of Gideon Smith, who was reputed to be the first African-American student. And we're gonna, we're gonna commission a bust or a painting or something. Um, and so he went and he came back with a photograph and it had a couple of African-Americans in it. And I said, well, who are those two? And he's like, I don't know who they are. And I was like, well, <laughs> you know, you need to go find out who they are. And he started a journey. And one day he came to me and he said, you're not going to believe what I'm finding. There were people, people here before Gideon. And there were people here after Gideon. And they did things, amazing things in this culture. And so for three years, we dug into old newspapers and old, I mean, just, oh my goodness. And thank God for newspapers.com, which is like, because I remember doing research where you had to go to the library, you had to travel a hundred miles to get to a, a, a main library and you, you, you had sit with the old microfilm and the microfiche and maybe at the end of the day there were like two citations that you could use and now we have these um, search uh, engines that search as quickly or as fast as Google thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of newspapers and so we just became detectives and what we discovered was between 1910 and the mid 1920s, African-Americans came to this institution, Fair State Institution from Hampton, Virginia. And uh, next slide. Uh, one of them was Belford Lawson. And Belford Lawson was the first African-American to win a case before the United States Supreme Court, not Thurgood Marshall. It was Belford Lawson. We didn't know that. We have people here at this institution that teach history who didn't know that. We have archivists here who did not know that. It's, that's why I challenge, everywhere I go, I challenge people to go back and look at the past and, and write better histories. And by better histories, I mean accurate histories. Next slide. That's another one of them, Percival Prattis. In 1947, he became the first African-American to be admitted to the press corps of the United States Houses of Congress. We didn't know anything about him. The university didn't know anything about him. And there were others, many, 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 many others. If we don't wanna, if we don't want black history and white history, I know I said it earlier, I'll say it again. If we don't want women's history and Jewish history, then just do it right. Next slide. So here's a quote. I don't have a lot in common with H. Ross Perot. We don't agree on a whole lot of things. But we do agree on this. I, I wish he hadn't used such gendered language, but um, the activist is not the man who says the river is dirty. The activist is the man who cleans the river. There are people who don't like the way we do it. They think the approach of the Jim Crow Museum is too in your face. It's too risky. Um, it's unnecessarily risky, but our paint legs are wet. And I challenge others, if you don't like the way we do it, then you do it some way. Next slide. Um, so now I'm afraid I'm gonna die before this happens, but we're in the process, we're gonna build a new museum, a two-story standalone place. And we're gonna bring people from all over this world um, in big numbers to have the kinds of conversations that we need to have as a nation. And we're gonna do it there. Next slide. So I'd like to leave with, with, with this notion. Um, and I'll tell, you, I'll tell you where this comes from. Um, when I was growing up, uh, we would see like people, we were poor, but we would see poor people and we were always told, don't feel sorry for that person. <clears throat> Um, you know, don't do that. And when I share that with people, 
they misunderstand what that meant. Well, what it meant was is feeling sorry for someone is for you. It's not for the other person. It doesn't do anything for the other person. So once again, this is from, from my brain. It's not especially profound. It's just, you know, something I'd like to share in with. Compassion is not pity, not even empathetic pity. There is arrogance and haughty pride in pitying others. Compassion is when we are confronted with another suffering and we suffer with them. Their pain is ours. We are motivated to relieve their suffering. When we feel true compassion, true compassion, we help those who suffer, not as a cathartic release, but because it breaks our heart that they are hurting. But right now, you know, I'm hurting like a lot of you are for, for our nation. Um, hurting because it, it too often takes the killing of a black man or a black woman to get us, as or we as a nation, to talk about race. I'm hurting because every night we go to sleep knowing that there are so-called bad parts of town, that we have a disease which disproportionately kills people that are older and poorer and dark, that African-American children are twice as likely to die the first year of life, that there are racial inequities in every part of our society. That hurts. So, you know, the, the challenge is what, what are we going to do about it? What role can we play? And in the museum, the role we can play is this. We can't do everything, but we can do this. We can document what happened. And we can create a space where people can talk intelligently about what happened. And then we can end the conversation with the question, what should we as a nation and we as individuals do now? Thank you very much. And um, went through that pretty fast just to make sure that we had an opportunity uh, to have questions. Wow. Dr. Pilgrim, if we were all together under normal circumstances, I am extremely confident this is the point where you would get a, a standing ovation from our uh, several hundreds uh, of guests that have joined us today. That is uh, quite a fascinating presentation. Um, what's stunning to me amongst the many, many things that, that you covered um, to think that just four years ago, um, some of these images uh, that you showed surfaced across social, what would appear to be social media. And that's really frightening, um, shocking, alarming, and everything, uh, every other adjective that, that uh, you, you, I, you can think of to describe uh, just the, the continuous racism and hate that, that goes on in, in our country um, and around the world for that matter. So thank you for that presentation. Um, it is quite enlightening. We're gonna now open it up. Our, our uh, audience has been very, generous in coming up with a number of uh, excellent questions uh, that I'm going to field to you right now. As a reminder to our audience, uh, the chat window is still open. Feel free to chime in with any questions and we'll do our very best um, to get to them as uh, before our, our time runs out in about uh, a little bit less than 30 minutes as we let Dr. Pilgrim get on with, with his day. Um, Dr. Pilgrim, I'm going to start with, with uh, the beautiful rendering you saw of the new building that's that's being built. Um, God willing, you will be here to, to show it off proudly. Um, where is that going to be located exactly? Yeah, uh, our current facility is on the Ferris campus. This will also be on the Ferris campus. It'll be the first building that you see when you drive onto campus. Anticipated uh, timeline for breaking ground? Uh, as soon as I raise $15 million. So. 15. I'm, I 15 million, 5-0? Uh, 15. 15. Five. Yeah, so I'm hoping in about three, four years. That's great. All right, so we're going we're gonna to group our questions into three different categories. We're going to start with collecting. Um, a number of people chimed in and have some questions about, uh, you know, specific to, to collecting um, uh, of artifact, of whatever you want to call them. The first uh, question is, I have a quote, mammy teapot, mm -hmm. no longer display it in my teapot collection. What is the proper way to dispose of it? Breaking it to pieces seems right, but that increases the market value for those that remain, question mark. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about increasing the market value because those objects are still being created. 
Um, and um, yeah, I probably should have mentioned this earlier that I don't believe there's an object in the museum that's not currently being made. Uh, some of them are being made as fake antiques, but others are just being made as new reproductions. And so the, the, the type of, excuse me, the type of object that you mentioned, <clears throat> the mammy cookie jars, those are, those are being cranked out uh, tens of thousands a year. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about, I wouldn't worry about thinking you're gonna affect the market one way or the other. Okay, great. Dr. Pilgrim, did you start this collection with a motive to take the pieces out of circulation? Well, the first one I did because I broke it. Um, but I went to a historically black college uh, 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 for a while, Jarvis Christian College. And I think it was there that, well, I know it was there that I saw teachers use objects as teaching tools. So one day, one of my teachers came in, he had like a, a chauffeur's cap. And he said, so what does this have to do with Jim Crow? We were like, oh, you know, doing Jim Crow, we had a race segregated um, uh, job economy. And um, he was like, no, that's not the right answer. And so we started giving him variations. And by the way, that was a correct answer. But uh, we started giving him variations of the same answer. And finally, he told us that if you were an African-American during those periods, you might have had a nice car. You know, there was a small professional class and that the chauffeur's cap was a way to stay alive. Because if you were stopped by a white police officer or any white person who thought that you were out of your place by owning a nice car, you could put on that chauffeur's cap, which basically said, I know my place. This is not my car. I'm not a threat to you. And that was so deep that he could use a chauffeur's cap that I thought, well, surely I can use the objects that I'm using uh, as teaching tools. Great. As a reminder for everyone, the presentation that Dr. Pilgrim gave will be available. It's being recorded and it will be available by going to the Moth Museum of Jewish Heritage website. It'll be easily accessible there for all those that want to share it or watch it again. Um, Dr. Pilgrim, last year, another uh, attendee writes, uh, last year I came across a store in Northeast Ohio, not far from the Cleveland area, that was selling items that seemed to be appropriate for your museum. Mm -hmm. Are you interested in such items? Yeah, do not do not spend any money uh, for objects uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, you're not going to empty the market, okay? So that's not going to happen. Also, we currently, we display probably nine or 10,000 objects in the museum, but we're receiving thousands of objects a, a year. So we now have more objects um, in storage than we do display. That's not gonna be a problem in the new facility because it's gonna be five times larger, but um, I, don't want, I don't want anyone spending a dime uh, on these objects. Also, I did not mention earlier that we also have a section of the museum on African-American achievement. And uh, uh, again, it's not who we are, but, but you have to tell that story. It's a whole lot easier for me to spend my money on those objects than, than, than the other objects. But I do not want people spending money on these pieces. Please don't do that. Great advice. Um, another uh, attendee writes, asks the original birth, birth of a Nation film, in the original Birth of a Nation film, do you agree with the group that wants all copies destroyed or the group that wants it to never be shown even in educational settings? or do you think it should be used? Yeah, I don't agree with the first two groups. And, um, you know, I, um, I'm often in this debate and I certainly understand, um, you know, the, the sentiment, but no, I'm not for, well, let me put it this way. I've always felt that objects like the ones I collect should either be destroyed or used as teaching tools. And so that's, that's where I stand on, on this. Um, um, I, I, you know, we have the old, uh, you know, movies like uh, Birth of a Nation and Gone with the Wind and Pinky and, you know, any zillion of uh, anime, animated. I think it's important that, that uh, we be able to document those things happen. So I'm not for, uh, I'm not for destroying them all, but like if, they, if they're not being used as teaching tools, you know, I just as well they're in a garbage can. 
And I know from watching the questions that come in, uh, Dr. Pilgrim, we have a number of educators that have been watching your presentation and they've already said, I've seen a number of uh, responses saying that, that this is incredible uh, uh, tools for them to be able to share with their graduate students that they'll be taking your presentation and sharing it within uh, the educational setting, which is terrific to see. Yes. Let's move on, Let's move on now to uh, some questions regarding racism. Um, where does the name Jim Crow come from? Who or what is the source? Someone wants to know. Yeah, so uh, I've only spent 30 years trying to answer that question. And my answer now is, is um, the common story is, is that there was a, a white uh, actor uh, named Thomas Rice who blackened his face, got on stage uh, uh, under the stage persona, Jim Crow. Um, and uh, that's certainly how the name got popular. Uh, but, you know, I've found, I have found evidence that the name predated him, but, but I'm not yet ready to make the argument about its origins. So what I would say is, is, is the actor Thomas Rice with his performance and the, um, the song which went with the performance uh, popularized the name. A, a more difficult question is at what point did Jim Crow become a synonym for the racial hierarchy in the US? Uh, like we, our brains, we like nice, neat, like pre-enslavement, enslavement, Jim Crow, reconstruction, civil rights. We like to think like that, but you know, Frederick Douglass during the enslavement period uh, complained of having to ride a Jim Crow car, you know, so uh, there were Jim Crow, Jim Crow was being used as a synonym for, um, for this mistreatment of African Americans before the quote Jim Crow period, if you would. So that's a long convoluted answer. That's the best I can give you right now. Interesting. Does the museum attempt to educate self-proclaimed racist groups? Uh, not, not as groups. Obviously, uh, we have, I mean, we're open and free to the public. And so, um, you know, uh, we would be available for that. Uh, we, 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 you know, we have had over the years, people who were ideological racist. Uh, and by that, I mean, they, you know, they belong to some group. Um, you know, out themselves uh, during a, you know, a museum experience. But we have not targeted, um, you know, we have not, we have not done it as a target, no. Got it. Dr. Pilgrim, I've done a number of these uh, moderated discussions over, over the years, and I, I found one common, um, co common thread when you ask, you know that your, you know that your presentation is effective, when people start donating to your cause. And I've seen a number of people chime in already saying that they've already donated to your capital campaign to get that new building built. So well, that, thank you. Props to you. Thank you very much. Very effective. Um, what do America's racial problems have in common with India and Nazi Germany? Oh, wow. Well, uh, that's a really long, <laughs> that's a really long question. Uh, I will, I will, let me just give a couple pieces of that. One is when you reduce people, I mean, I, I like when the, I, I, I may have said this earlier, but um, you know, one of the things uh, when you go to Europe and they talk about stereotypes are actually caricatures, not stereotypes, as a way of reducing people, flattening them out so that they are one dimensional. Uh, I think that's a similarity where when we reduce people to one dimensional caricatures, uh, that, that are accompanied by negative stereotypes. And it's much easier to abuse those people. And of course, power differences are part, are, or would also uh, play a role in both. And misrepresentations. See, I'm gonna keep answering this for the next 20 minutes. Uh, certainly misrepresentations, um, Kit, go ahead. You wanna end it there? And yeah, I'll end it there. Okay, terrific. Um, and hate. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was going to say and hate and fear because unfortunately, hate and fear are two effective uh, organizing 
um, efforts. I mean, you can you can organize, and it breaks my heart to say this, but you can organize around hate and fear, probably more successfully than 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 around some more noble attributes, and we see that right now. Okay, obviously a difficult uh, and, and very complicated uh, time. Mm -hmm. How did, Dr. Pilgrim, how does the museum connect these dehumanizing images with how African-Americans are dehumanized or seen as, quote, brutes today? Yeah, actually, the brute itself is a caricature. And so in the museum, we have a, um, a, a showcase which talks about how African-Americans primarily, but not exclusively, young males uh, in our country's past were portrayed as murderers of white men and rapers of white women, and how that was used as a justification for, um, for lynchings. And so we, for us, that's a very direct correlation. It's actually the first caricature case that you see in the museum um, because, it, because it's so consequential. And, and that's one of those caricatures that became very popular after the enslavement period ended during Reconstruction because of this fear of what was called at the time Negro domination, uh, this fear that Blacks were, gonna, were, were going to get whites back. Uh, also this idea that African-Americans without the restraints of enslavement would result to uh, barbaric behavior. And that's kind of like uh, one of the big messages of the movie Birth of a Nation. And the other reason we have it in the museum is because it's still a dominant image of African-Americans. And that includes often when African-American uh, movie producers themselves or, or musical performers themselves who, um, you know, who, who, who act out the caricature of the group. Well, that's a great segue into our next question that someone coincidentally had asked. Uh, my husband and I are fans of the work of filmmaker Spike Lee. Mm -hmm. In addition to a Do the Right Thing poster, we have a bamboozled poster. Mm -hmm. Is it inappropriate for us to display this image? I mean, that's, I mean, listen, I don't want to live in a culture where, um, where, first of all, where it's illegal to do stuff, but even where I tell people not to. What I, what I want is, is, is that people think, um, you know, about, about what the images represent, right? So there's two bamboozled po posters. I'm assuming they're referencing the one, not the other. Um, I mean, that would be a family decision that would be, you know, in, in their home. Uh, keep in mind, you're talking to a person who at one point had over 2,000 pieces in, in, in my home before I donated them to Fair State University. I know how I was using them. I was using them uh, as a sort of mini museum to have discussions with people that came into my home. Okay. Given that racist objects are currently being mass produced, mm -hmm. is there any wisdom in attempting to boycott the companies that do so or the stores that sell them? Yeah, so um, I, I don't think so. Um, I wish there were, but I don't think so. I'll give you an example. There's a cookie jar that we have that uh, was in a lot of the uh, uh, stores, and I don't want to name some of the stores, but, um, and, and there were eight of them. <clears throat> and so when you lifted the head of the, they were all animals. When you lifted the head of the dog, it barked. When you lifted the head of the um, uh, horse, it made a horse noise. But when you lifted the head of the alligator, it said, mm -mm, them show is some tasty cookies. And that was playing on this narrative of how African-Americans are food for alligators, if you would. So just as a coincidence, some of the executives from that store, they came to the museum as a kind of workshop. And I happened to mention to them that that object was in their stores. And they went and had those removed throughout the state. And so here I am feeling like, oh, wow, I'm an amazing activist, right? This is awesome. These people are taking this out of their stores. But it didn't eliminate the objects. They just went, uh, they either entered the secondary market where people resold them, 
or they sold them to other stores. So the answer, I think, is in changing the hearts and minds of people, as corny as that sounds, where there's no market. Okay. So we have a couple questions regarding the one slide that, that you showed uh, of, quote, the blackface slide. Yeah. Um, first question that comes in is, what is the significance of the hand gesture in that slide? Uh, let me hold on for a second. Uh, I, I don't think that, and I could be wrong, I don't think that slide that has a specific meaning other than that the two people are performing what they believe is gang insignia. Um, so gang, gang G-A-N-G, right? Uh, and so um, I don't, you know, uh, you know, I've had people say, oh, that looks like it's a fraternity or a sorority sign, whatever. Um, yeah, that's the best answer I can give. I'm sorry, I can't give a better answer. Okay. Um, as we move into some questions regarding education, keeping it in, in, in the same uh, context as the blackface slide, um, this person writes, I do not mean to sound ignorant, but is the utilization of a blackface racist by default? Mm -hmm case of Kansas State University in 2016, I think that's the slide we're referencing, mm -hmm. be a case of unintentional racism. Yeah, I mean, it could have been, except the, the, um, the, the text that they posted with it, you know, uh, you know, included a racial slur. And so, uh, but to the, to the spirit of the question, let me say this, that's, that's why we exist as a museum like I'm, I'm, I'm in this presentation being very opinionated and very direct about what I believe. However, if we were in the museum facilitating a discussion, that's exactly the kind of discussion where we have fruitful dialogue, which is, is, is blackface in and of itself always wrong? And so you have someone saying, well, you know, I could be doing this to celebrate Tiger Woods, or I could be doing this to celebrate this person, uh, there was no intention there. And someone else is saying, yeah, but intentional or not, it offended me that the, the uh, forgive the pun, but the stable genius of the museum is that we bring those peoples together so that they can listen to one another. Okay, so we know that the museum is an incredible resource for education itself. One, one uh, attendee wants to know, um, are there actual educational components integrated into the curriculum at Ferris State University as well? Yeah, so uh, we're working on that, uh, but the last year, so we have an education coordinator. And to be uh, totally honest with you, her work has primarily been with high schools. And so what we've been doing is trying to create um, curriculum for, uh, I think it's like um, six areas in the, um, uh, uh, what do you call it, the, um, the competencies, you know, throughout the state of Michigan. And so the, the, the short answer to your question is no, because our efforts have been focused on uh, the high school system. Okay, so uh, some educators also asked about any programming specifically to uh, K through eight. Yeah. Well, no, 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 let me, uh, so this is a great question. And that is this, we have had debates. Now there's only like six or seven of us in the actual museum, but there are a lot of advisors. We have had debates for the last 10 years about what age is appropriate for people to come in the museum. I'm of the opinion that people should start talking about race as soon as they understand words but that doesn't mean they should come to the Jim Crow Museum. Uh, that's not the opinion of some of the other folks, but currently children under the eighth, under eighth grade are discouraged from coming to the museum. There are no tours from them, but they can come with their parents. Our program has been directed toward uh, uh, ninth through 12th grades. And then um, we have worked with colleges to help them develop curriculum if they're willing to do some of the work, but we're doing all the work to develop the curriculum for the high schools. So another person asked that ties into a follow-up question would be, 
workshops over the summer for educators or you yeah. Part yeah. Of so that's uh, so now we're developing. Now we've always done workshops, but they've they. they um, I'm trying to figure out how how would you say this. They've been more um, like um, like done specific for that company, and so not not trying to find a a a template, if you would, that would fit in a number of groups. Okay. Got it. Um, we're getting ready to wrap up. I'm gonna. Uh, we're gonna have one final question, um, Dr. Pilgrim. Um, are you doing? Uh, this is sort of ties into what's been going on in current events. Um, your thoughts on seeing the Confederate flag being flown a few weeks ago huh. in the Capitol? How did it make you feel uh, when it was first shown? What were your initial thoughts on that? Well, I was not surprised because uh, for the last 20 years, I've been, um, even before, you know, we understood what the internet is and the internet became what it became, I was always on, uh, you know, mailing lists for white supremacy groups and the like. Um, and, you know, understood that over the last four or five years, um, that white supremacy groups have, you know, been empowered in this country. So I was certainly was not surprised. We have those discussions in the museum, but of course I was disappointed. I grew up in Alabama when George Wallace was the governor. And um, I heard rhetoric over the last few years that reminded me um, of the rhetoric uh, that I heard as a child, as a teenager, as a young adult in Alabama. And uh, quite frankly, I thought those days were gone in terms of the public sphere. I, I assumed that there would always be a fringe element where you would hear that, but I, uh, you know, I, I was naive. I mean, there's just no two ways about it. I was naive. So uh, when I sort of, um, you know, started documenting this sort of resurgence uh, over the last, you know, half decade or so, uh, you know, it, it um, well, let's put it this way. No, I was not surprised, but I was, I was disappointed. Okay. We're gonna leave it at that, Dr. Pilgrim. This is, I wish we could continue. I have many, many more questions. Um, it's again, a, it, it's a great sign of, of a very important dialogue, topic, discussion. And uh, on behalf of all of us in, in our great city of Cleveland, Ohio, um, I want to be sure that every, I want to thank you for spending your time today on this important day with us here in, in Cleveland and for those watching uh, and viewing this around the world. I want to uh, a little bit of housekeeping, make sure everyone that's uh, in the audience today, you know that if you haven't done so already, you can, uh, you're entitled to a free virtual tour of the museum. Uh, in a follow up to this program, you'll be emailed, um, a re everyone that's registered, you'll be, you'll receive a link um, to the tour. If you'd like to check it out now, you can find it under program description at maltmuseum.org. Uh, That's www.maltmuseum.org. Um, and you can follow the MLK Day program graphic at the top of the page to take a virtual tour. On behalf of the Malt Museum of Jewish Heritage, with support from the Jewish Federation of Cleveland's Community Relations Committee and the many community partners, I wanna thank you, Dr. David Pilgrim, for your time with us again today for the work you do each and every day. Our work as a society is nowhere near done. We know that um, the rendering again of your soon to be built um, new, new uh, building um, on the uh, not too distant horizon, God willing, <laughs> hopefully us here, all of us uh, here watching will, will uh, contribute to the cause to help you get started a little bit earlier. That rendering is beautiful. Mm -hmm. Written on the wall inside the Moth Museum are the words of Edmund Burke, which ring true now, and I quote, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing, end quote. Mm. Let's continue to do the work together to stop the hate. Mm. Dr. Pilgrim, thank you once again. Everyone, enjoy your day, be safe, be healthy, and uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you.